Good morning. Welcome to the worship of Almighty God here at Wexford Community Presbyterian Church. I'm Tyler Domsky. I'm the pastor here. It's a delight to have you here. It's a wonderful day to worship God, and it's a wonderful day to do so together. So thanks for being here. Let's worship God. One of the joys that we have in worshiping together each and every week is being able to greet one another with the love of Christ. We are still able to do that even though we're in this virtual space. So I would invite you to take a moment to pause the video, reach out to someone, text them, call them, email them, do whatever you need to do to let them know that you thank God for them, that you are glad that they are in your life. Uh, it's an important thing for us to recognize that we are part of a community, that even though we may not be in the same space as those people, that we are called to do this together, that faith is not a private thing. Uh, but it's something that we do together in community. Just as we live together, uh, we experience God the best when we are in community. So let's take a moment, let's pause the video, and let's reach out and greet one another with the love of Christ. As you can see, I have a very nicely folded towel here. And I just spent so much time making sure this was just nice and neat for you guys. In, in what ways do you think we could use this towel? Is that you're saying, oh, to dry off, maybe to mop something up, maybe to sit on, maybe to use it as a pillow. It, it's actually really soft. <laughs> you know, it's interesting to me that I didn't hear anybody say, put it on a shelf and just look at it and admire it and never touch it. Cause that's, that's what I think we should do with it. See, 
All of your suggestions sound really nice to do to somebody else's towel, okay? Not your towel, come on. Because we did the things you're suggesting with this towel, it would get all nasty and dirty and messed up and wrinkly. That would be really sad, right? What? No. What do you mean, no? That's what it's supposed to be for? Come on now. Are you telling me? Ha! <laughs> you're, you're ridiculous. You're funny. You're saying that this towel can be refolded and washed and put away when you're done using it? Hmm. Well, I guess let me try this out. <sighs> this feels so wrong. Never unfolded this before. Okay, I'm gonna just pretend to dry myself off. Oh my gosh, it worked. It folded back up again. Hmm. I appreciate you guys. Like I've spent so much money buying new towels. Anyway, in today's scripture story, there is not a towel, but there is a storm. And the disciples, as you can imagine, are really worried about it. In a lot of ways, I hope this analogy can work for me. In a lot of ways, the disciples are a lot like my towel, where they started the day off all nice and neat and presentable to the world. But then when this storm shows up, but when the storm so but when the storm but when the storm showed up, they got so worried about the storm and the waves that they got all stormy and wavy inside of themselves. Sort of like Does that does that look like waves? I don't know if that looks like what. Listen, guys, I <laughs> I was trying to come up with a good analogy. <laughs> just, just go with me here. Once the disciples got all stirred up and twisted on the inside, you know what they did? They did something really, really smart. They decided to ask Jesus for help. And do you guys know what happened once they asked Jesus for help? He calmed the storm. Jesus smoothed out the waves. Just like the disciples in today's story, we have moments in our lives where we get all twisted and bunched up, which then makes us worry so much that we begin to feel like this towel looks. Can you guys relate? I can relate. And I think that this story is a good reminder. When you feel all twisted and stormy, when you're scared and worried, just remember you don't have to stay like that. Instead, we can do like the disciples did, and we can ask Jesus for help. And when we ask Jesus for help, Jesus will do what he always does. He's going to help us to use and know God's love, light, and life. Which is going to do what, you think? That's right. Letting in God's love is going to help us smooth out all the storminess and twistedness we feel inside. Which then helps us, then helps us not only to feel better, but also maybe, maybe to help someone else who's feeling all stormy and twisted. Maybe God can use us to help someone else who's, who's still feeling worried. So, that's the good news for today. Let's pray. Bow your eyes, close your heads, repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for your love. And thank you for Jesus, who teaches us how to pay attention to you, so that the storm on our insides can be calmed. Help us to look to Jesus when we feel worried or scared. And help us to remember that you are always with us. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. You guys have a wonderful day. I'll catch you later. Bye. Another important aspect of worship each and every week is the sense of offering. 
offering is not just a financial opportunity. It's a recognition that God has blessed us. God has invited us into what God is doing in the world and has invited us to use our individual gifts, the, the gifts that make each of us unique. Uh, if you think of it like a choir, uh, we are all invited to sing in our own voice, not to sing uh, in unison necessarily, but to sing in harmony, to bring our own interpretation, our own abilities to the choir and to bring what we have. And each of our gifts are different. And so uh, this time of offering is, is not because God needs it, but it's because God is inviting us to take part in this community. We can do that in a lot of different ways. We can do that with our time, with our uh, abilities, with our creativity, with our uh, experience, with our understanding, with our discernment, and uh, even with our finances. If you'd like to give directly to the church, you could do that very easily at wexfordcpc.org slash give. You could also send things directly to the church. They get deposited every week. Uh, but it's an important time for us to consider what it is that God has blessed us with and how we can contribute that to the larger community and to take part in what God is doing. So with that in mind, let's present to God our tithes and our offerings. Join me at this time for prayer. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, in Christ, you taught us to pray and promised that we would receive all that we ask in his name. Hear now our prayers for the Church Universal, for this congregation, its mission and ministry, for the healing of the earth, for peace and justice in the world, for nations and leaders, for our local community, for the poor and oppressed, for the bereaved and lonely, and for all who need healing. Guide us, O oh God, by your Holy Spirit, that all of our prayers and all of our lives may serve your will and show your love. Through Christ Jesus, our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This week's scripture reading is from Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. Listen to the word of the Lord. On that day when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and sea obey him? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So this is a pretty familiar story of the disciples crossing the Sea of Galilee, getting caught in a storm. And in this version, Jesus is with them. Jesus is asleep. And so the disciples wake him up in the middle of the storm. They're freaking out. And they say, don't you care that we're going to die? Because it is kind of unusual that he's sleeping through the storm. Jesus gets up, stops the storm, and says to them, why were you so afraid? Now that seems like a really weird question to ask, and so let's look at what that really means. Uh, we can add kind of the intonation of it, of it, whether he was angry, why were you afraid? Or if he was just saying, "What? there's nothing to be afraid of. Uh, I tend to think of it that way, almost as though... Um, Thinking of like when you're a, you're a kid and you may be scared by a thunderstorm. We just had a really big thunderstorm this past week. And you may have had to talk to a child. Or if you were a child, you may have had this situation happen before. Uh, where your parent says to you, There's, you don't need to be afraid. We're okay. But when you're a kid, that fear seems real. A thunderstorm seems pretty terrifying. And in reality, um, from, a, from a statistical standpoint, there's not really much to fear in a thunderstorm bad things can happen, but the chances of them happening to you are pretty slim. And so what Jesus is saying in that sense is he's kind of giving them comfort, but he also is recognizing something that's pretty consistent with that throughout scripture. So one of the biggest things that we see in scripture is this sense of people coming up and saying, do not be afraid. Uh, scripture probably says that phrase to us about as much as anything that it says in um, any declarative statements. Uh, every time an angel shows up, they say, do not be afraid. So many of the Psalms are telling us to fear not. Um, and even in um, 1 John, one of the biggest things that it says is that fear is the opposite of love. That perfect fear casts out, or perfect love casts out fear. And that if you have fear in, in you, you haven't really accepted love. So what does that mean? If we're looking at fear as kind of this ultimate thing that stops us. Uh, oftentimes we think of, of uh, the opposite of belief, the opposite of faith being doubt. But that's never communicated. That's never really um, criticized. There are times when people, when Jesus says, why don't you believe? He even said it in this story, but he doesn't say it as though that is the end all be all. It's more concerned about being afraid of something. Um, Thomas, as a doubter, we have turned into a negative, but Jesus doesn't see Thomas as, as really the, the bad guy in that story. Uh, he doesn't criticize or rebuke Thomas for having doubted any of that. Um, and we see from that standpoint that, that the opposite of faith is not doubt, but fear. Because fear can keep us from doing things. It can paralyze us. We, because we're afraid to do something, we won't get on a plane, uh, we won't go on a roller coaster, we won't talk to someone who might hurt our feelings, we won't confront someone about a way in which they've made us feel bad. Um, all of these are, could be well-founded fears. They could be legitimate fears that, are, that have very clear reasons, but they stop us from doing things. They stop us from connecting with folks. They stop us from taking responsibility. 
Um, doubt, doubt is something that we deal with all the time. Uh, we constantly have to go forward with lack of information, with, with uncertainties. We'll go into um, a meeting or an encounter or an opportunity unclear as to how things are going to go. Uh, every sporting event involves a level of doubt. There's a chance we could lose. So the, the sense of doubt, the, the sense of not knowing something is different than the fear that comes from doubt. Doubt can kind of lead to fear, but it's that fear that stops us from doing things. So one, one way to, to look at this is our other story today, which actually didn't read the, the full thing of it, but it's the David and Goliath story, which is a story that we, we know pretty well. Uh, and, and the passage for it was really, really long. It'd take a while to read. So, but the, the general story is that, uh, the army of Israelites is up against the army of Philistines. And, uh, oftentimes in these ancient armies would go against each other. They would send out a champion, uh, to fight rather than having the full armies fight because it was just an easier thing. And so they would basically have like a wrestling match, not a wrestling match, but like a WWE kind of challenge. And then whoever won would then... Uh, both sides would agree like that army won. And sometimes, as you see at the end of this story, then the guy who won their army would just chase the other army away. I don't know why they agreed to that. but um, So that's what's happening here is that they, they don't want to fight a full-on battle. So Goliath comes out and says, I want to send somebody to fight me. Goliath is huge. Um, we, we've talked about this in the past, but uh, if, if you didn't hear that conversation, there were basically at this point three kinds of fighters in the military. There were uh, these giant bulky guys. So think like Andre the Giant. That's what Goliath is. And they would wear lots of armor. They would carry a staff uh, that was really long. And they would basically be like a tank. Because they didn't have tanks. But they, these are big guys that can get at you. And they have these big long staffs. And the staffs could stab a horse. And so there was, there was that. The, the Kind of the tanks. There were cavalry. People who ride on horses. Uh, cav- cavalry. Not cavalry. Um, and they would ride on horses. They could get in close. And they could... Um, uh, shoot arrows and things like that and the armor uh, couldn't get through the tanks and the tank the big soldiers could basically again stab the horses and the horses couldn't get through and then the third was basically the artillery and the t- artillery were people who would throw stones because uh, the stones there are incredibly hard and a slingshot is a weapon it's not a toy and we think of it as like a like Dennis the Menace with a slingshot but it's a really violent weapon and they have tested the rocks in the Valley of Elah, this real place, and the ability for people to throw those slings like that um, with the, the, the hardness of those rocks and the way that they shoot it out, it's basically the same firepower as a gun. Uh, and so what's going on here is that the Goliath is, uh, is calling them to send a warrior. None of the Israelites are willing to go down there because they're all, none of they don't have a tank that big. And Goliath is saying, basically, come at me with a tank. And David's the only one. And David gets mad and says, why are you all afraid of this guy? And he's cursing God, like, why, why are you afraid of him? And we read this story as overcoming our fears of, of David having uh, overcoming odds that David shouldn't have won and, and only God gave him the ability to win. And yes, that's true, but David shouldn't have won because he's not a good tank. But David was an excellent uh, rock thrower. And that was part of the deal too. And so the reason why no one thought they could beat Goliath is because they thought that they had to be a tank. And David's the only one who said, well, I'm not a good tank, but I am a good artillery guy. And so basically... David brings a gun to a knife fight and he wins and he wins in a way that shouldn't be surprising because the artillery could beat the tanks. Like that's just the way that it worked. It was like rock, paper, scissors with the artillery and the cavalry and the, uh, the tanks. And so that becomes a story less about overcoming insurmountable odds and more about not being paralyzed by your fears. Because what was happening is that everyone else in that story is be identifying themselves by what they are, by their greatest weakness, by what they're not able to do. And David identifies himself by what his strength is. He's not a big guy. 
And everybody else thinks he's a tank too. He goes to Saul the king. Saul's like, here's some armor. I guess you're gonna be a tank. And he tries to put the armor on and it doesn't fit him. And it's not because he's a little kid. It's because he's a normal sized person. He's not a big bulky like linebacker. He's a running back. He's a, he's a punter. <laughs> and so um, everyone in the story assumes that he is going to um, play the game in a certain way. And he's the only one who knows that's not my strength. My strength is this. This is what, how God has blessed me. God has given me this gift. And so I'm going to use this gift to um, succeed. And it, that combination of, of not being paralyzed by his fear and recognizing that God is with him, that God has not only, not only is God with him in a miraculous way, but God has been with him and, and has given him gifts that he can use. That gets us back to kind of where Jesus is asking these two questions. Why are you afraid? Don't you believe? Basically, don't you believe that God is with you? Don't, believe, don't you believe that, that God's gonna, God has a reason why you're here? That God has gifted you with certain things and right now God has put me here and you'll be okay? And that your story doesn't end this way? Fear becomes a, a weird thing because we, we often kind of think about it as this Jesus take the wheel type situation, which is just when you're afraid, just kind of turn everything over to God. And that's uh, not realistic in, in terms of that song. There's a song, Jesus Take the Wheel, where in the middle of the song, literally the, uh, a woman is in a, is in, hits ice in her car and she just throws her hands up in the air and says, Jesus, take the wheel. That's a terrible thing to do, by the way. Don't ever do that. Uh, I don't think that's how God works. I don't think that God works by us throwing ourselves off of a cliff and saying, please catch me which is basically what Jesus take the wheel is. And that's not what overcoming your fear is. Overcoming your fear isn't doing stupid things to prove that God exists. That's exactly what the devil tempts Jesus with during the temptation in the wilderness is literally, why don't you throw yourself off this cliff so that God can show how great God is? Um, Overcoming fear is not testing God. Overcoming fear is not letting our fear stop us from being the person who God made us to be from using the gifts that we have rather than uh, being afraid of the gifts that we don't by being paralyzed by our weaknesses. The story of David, again, is less a story of an underdog and more a story of knowing who you are rather than who everybody tells you that you are. Um, we talked about this the last couple of weeks about um, our identity needs to come from God. Our, our sense of who we are um, isn't by our family in the David story or the leaders around us or the, 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 uh, the people who are supposed to protect us. Um, it only comes from God. In the David story, everyone is telling him, his brothers, the king, everybody, the Philistines, they're all telling him that he is not good enough. And David says, well, I'm not good enough. He knows he's not good enough to be Goliath, but he's not Goliath. That he, that God has given him certain gifts. And with those gifts, um, he can do what he needs to do. As we try to figure out who we are, not only as individuals, but also as a church, we can become paralyzed by fear, especially as we're coming out of this weird situation. There's so, church is so different now and every church is different. It's not just ours. Every church is going through um, this same situation that is really scary and pretty frightening. Um, I've said this uh, in several conversations over the past uh, couple weeks, so I may have said this in a sermon, but um, a lot of what has happened in the church over this past, over the pandemic has accelerated what was happening in the larger church overall um, as uh, religion has not has kind of stopped being the status quo stopped being uh, the, the the just obligatory thing that we do on Sundays we all go to church on Wednesdays we all go to bingo night on Fridays we all go to Elks Club like that those kind of things don't happen anymore just as a default and there was remnants of that but I was slowly going away and so what was happening is that probably over the next five years this sense of just nominal Christianity of of, of people just coming to church out of habit because they feel obligated to has slowly been trailing away. Um, And in a sense, the pandemic was almost like a windstorm that knocked all the leaves off of a, off of a tree. 
um, where uh, all of those leaves were falling anyway. But when they all fall overnight, it feels like either the tree died or just there's a huge mess. And so for us to have gone through this cultural shift in where the church is in the larger status quo um, is pretty shocking. And so we're no longer in a place where it's just automatic that people are involved in churches. And so the way that church looks as we start to re-enter into this place is going to look different. And that shouldn't paralyze us. We, um, there are a lot of ways that we can look at the weaknesses of the various churches of uh, a church, our size, a church with our type of budget, a church in our area, a church, um, with the staff that we have, um, we have limitations, but those limitations don't define us. What defines us are the ways in which we are gifted. Some, many of those limitations are also things that are, that are benefits to us. Uh, one of the things about being a a moderately smaller church is that we can actually know everybody in the community. Uh, we can do things relatively quickly. We have the opportunity to um, play around with some of the ways in which we do church together. One of the things of, about living in this time where the status quo, cultural status quo of Christianity has kind of waned uh, is that we don't have to... Um, just do church in the way that everybody expects we can we can really explore like what is it that god is calling us to do now that doesn't mean that we stop worshiping but do we have to worship in the same way do we have to to uh have all of the same programs that we used to do we have to do them all in the same way and i think that it gives us the opportunity to really re-examine who we are what God calls us to be, because none of what we do in the church is listed in the Bible in terms of like Sunday school or Bible school or Bible study. Like all, none of those are, are prescribed. Uh, all of the traditional things that we do as a church are just things that we've done for the last 30, 40, 50, 60, 100 years. And all of those things evolve and grow and they have different times for different seasons. And so we're at this opportunity right now to explore what it is that God is calling us to do and how best we can be present within the community that, we're, that God has put us and to use the gifts that we have to see our strengths instead of our weaknesses, to not be guided by our fears, but to be motivated by our sense that God is with us and to not let our doubts become fears, to let our doubts instead become curiosities. I'm a big proponent, and I say this a lot, about how we need to wonder, um, and that God desires that. And when we look at doubt as the opposite of faith, when we look at doubt as synonymous with fear, uh, we are completely missing the, the very nature of what it means to learn this sense of curiosity that little kids have that make them ask why over and over and over again, that comes from a sense of doubt, the sense of not of a lack of understanding, uh, a doubt is saying like, I don't really know, or maybe not like the doubt leads us to test things, leads us to discover things and leads us to explore. Uh, doubt shouldn't lead us to fear. If our goal is to know everything and we act like that's possible, then when you don't know everything, then you get afraid that other people will find that out. And so then doubt becomes something to be afraid of. If your goal is to become a tank and you're never going to be a tank, then you get paralyzed by the fact that people would think, would find out that you're not capable of doing that. In David's story, as everyone keeps trying to tell him, you're not a very good tank, but I guess you can try. David is the only, other, the only one who knows that what his gifts are will enable him to succeed, or at least enable him to have a chance. As we look at what our gifts are as individuals, what our gifts are as a church, we shouldn't be afraid, but we're going to have doubts because none of us knows 
what the next year is going to look like, what the next five years will look like, what the next decade will look like. But we can trust that God is with us. As Jesus tells us, why are you afraid? Don't you believe that I'm with you? Didn't you know that I was here the whole time? We don't have anything to be afraid of. We got lots to doubt, but those doubts shouldn't be a threat. Those doubts should make us curious. Those doubts should give us opportunities to be creative, to find new ways to do things, rather than trying to fit into a system that is guaranteed to make us feel like we've already lost. Let us know that God is with us. Let us go forward confident that even though we are in the midst of a storm that we don't understand, that Jesus is with us, that we have been blessed and um, equipped with gifts, gifts that we may not even fully understand yet, but that God knows us better than we know ourselves. Let us not be afraid to offer up something different than what everybody else expects. Let's not be afraid to change the way in which we do things. Because we don't always have to do things the way that we used to. And we pretty much can't. But that doesn't mean that God isn't with us. That doesn't mean that we should be afraid. That means that we just don't know. And that's okay. Fear not, for the Lord is with you. Amen.
sets me free. Your love sets me free. Your love sets me free. Your love sets me free. So now it's time for us to go. It's time for us to leave this place and to return back to what it is that God has in store for us this day, to be present with those who God has put around us and to be present where we are, whether that's uh, getting rest or getting doing work or something in between those two things. Uh, let us not forget that God is with us. Let us not be afraid. Um, we are, it's a normal thing to be afraid, but let us not be dominated by that. Let us not be paralyzed by that because God is with us. Let us know that there is nowhere that we can go and that God is not already present. We don't bring God to the world, but we bear witness to God in all that we say and do. That we are never without God. That we are never alone. That it's not up to us. It's not our, it, we're not left on our own to fix everything. Instead, we bear witness to what God is doing and we take part in what God is doing. Uh, helping others see God through what we say and do and helping them to see God present in the world. So let's go. And as we go, May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. Have a fantastic week. Uh, enjoy the, the summer. Hopefully, uh, if you're on vacation, uh, that you're traveling safe, um, either if you're there or on the way back. Um, but whatever it is that you have going on this week, I hope that uh, it brings you lots of joy and that you're able to do some good things and see some good things and be surprised by God this week. Have a great week. See you next week. Have a good week.